Some businesses succeed, some don't. Then there are those that seem to have been around forever. The true entrepreneurial success story. How did they do it? What was their vision? What makes a success? In this special episode for Eye on Annapolis, we speak with the true success stories, those business owners that have been around for decades, learn from their successes and failures. Now, here's host John Fernay. We're up here in Pasadena with the Hospice of the Chesapeake, and we are with the president and CEO, or perhaps the CEO and president, I'm not quite sure which, but Ben Mark Antonio, who has been with the hospice for, gosh, you've been here for about seven years now? It'll be seven years in April. Well, I know that hospice, I, um, I'll say, unfortunately, I have had the opportunity to work with not the hospice of the Chesapeake, but different hospices throughout the country for uh, my former mother-in-law and both of my parents in recent years. And I know what just a, a fabulous organization, a, a concept and everything else that it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit still not quite sure exactly what it is, but you know, you know what, what greatness it is. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about where we got the start and what it is that, that hospice does. It Really, hospice is a philosophy of care. And, and that's really what it stemmed out of. Is a, it's just thinking about how what people need at a stage of their life that is different than what they've needed at other moments of their life, particularly in relation to health care. And it grew out of um, this philosophy and movement, really, that uh, started in England in the late 60s um, and by Dom Cicely Saunders. And she was a, a, um, a nurse who was no longer able to practice as a nurse because of a back injury, became a social worker. Um, and as a social worker, began in, in her role as a caregiver, I should say, um, really just recognized that people's needs when they were dealing with serious illness and terminal illness in particular uh, were different um, slightly than what, um, than what people needed at, in, with relation to other illnesses or other stages of illness. And that was that they need, didn't only have physical needs, and she, which she recognized as a nurse, but had emotional needs and kind of logistical needs that, that didn't come up in other times in healthcare. And she started to address that in her work uh, as a caregiver, particularly with cancer patients who she was working with in London. And so she, the way she approached it was looking at the whole person, their physical comfort, their emotional comfort, their spiritual comfort, uh, because they were asking existential questions. What's been the meaning of my life? Um, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my loved ones? And she really listened attentively to that and responded to that from all those dimensions. Interestingly enough, when it came to managing physical pain, she found that the healthcare system in England, as it was in most other right. places, um, resistant to using more aggressive pain management with morphine and other things. So she, but she was pushing and saw the need for that. And so a physician friend of her said, "Well, the only pay physicians are going to listen to you is if you become a doctor." So she became a doctor. She took that philosophy and practice of care, um, looking at the whole person, and um, shared that with others. And it ended up coming to the United States. And um, the first hospice that was established was in the early 70s up in Connecticut. Um, and then uh, our own hospice here in um, Anne Arundel County was established in um, the late 70s, in 1970. Well, this is, a, so this is a fairly old hospice as far as hospices go, I would It is. Imagine. Yeah, we were one of the first in the country established. Um, there were sort of several that started up. The, the one I used to work with in California was probably, well, I, actually that was established in like 1974. Well, that's, uh, I, I'm actually shocked that the concept of hospice is so recent. Mm -hmm. um, I would have thought that this would have been a, you know, something in the 1700s. Well, I mean, I, yeah, interestingly enough, it, it was. So it's, th this iteration of it is recent, but it's really ancient um, in many ways. And it's about companioning people in their journey, which is our mission statement, right, of, of caring for life throughout the journey of illness and loss. It's, uh, and it was the practice of particularly um, religious communities and other leaders in the community that served the medical needs of people in the Middle Ages and uh, earlier. Uh, they called it like a, a soul accompaniment, accompaniment. They called it an right. anamakara and the Gaelic uh, cultures and the European cultures, it was more of the monastic support or the community support for people who were living with illness and dying. 
Interesting. So, but I mean, the the basic concept of of hospice today mm-hmm. is the the care, and that's defined as physical, mental, spiritual, and everything else for people that are terminally ill or at the end of their life. This is an option which I, I personally feel that everybody should take care, take advantage of if they possibly can. This is to make people feel as comfortable, however they want to define that, mm-hmm. throughout the life. Am I correct on that? You are in uh, that those needs are re- related to um, emotional support and questions that people have, the, the thoughts and feelings that they have, the physical pain. The, conditions change more significantly and, and more frequently in the latter stages of life than they do in other you know, progressions of illness earlier on. Yet, what we've learned in hospice care, that when we care for people in that way, that holistic way, and, a, and really listening for, is this a physical pain that they're talking about, or is it more of an emotional pain? Or is, is it rooted in some sort of spiritual tension in, that they brought in their life of a lack of forgiveness on their part or, or you know, giving that to others even decades maybe earlier? Those are the things, as, as we've practiced at the bedside of people who are dying, we realize how important it is to bring those that philosophy of care and that practice of care to other parts of the healthcare system, and that's where supportive care or palliative care comes in. That's that right. It's, it's, it, hospice being at the end of life, um, not just the last days or weeks, but the last months of life. That that journey that is evolving. Sure. Well, I know my father passed away about a year and a half ago, and uh, down in Florida, and had hospice care. You know. Later, later on, and I remember that it was it was an emotional thing that I got a call from the hospice nurse a week before he passed away, mm-hmm. saying that you know he and and we had been down there to visit and whatnot, but it's uh, you know he really would like to see you and your sister, not my yeah my sister his daughter you know the two of us <laughs> uh-huh. again and um, you know so we you know and that was just absolutely amazing it wasn't uh you know he needs more morphine he needs more whatever but i also think that you guys you guys are a medical mm-hmm. provider mm-hmm. Um, but you've got to be kind of at odds with some of the traditional medical providers if you will you know i, I know that mm-hmm. it's about pain if i am in pain and i need more morphine and i'm under hospice care mm-hmm. i can get that mm-hmm. so yeah it, it's and it's different depending on on the illness that the person's living with. So we think of pain and we think of maybe physical pain related to, you know, cancer and where it's located in the body or something. But for somebody who is at the later stages of heart disease, so, and this is where, you know, hospice has been traditionally, especially in the 80s and 90s and only more recently in the more recent decades related to other illnesses besides cancer and AIDS and some other, you know, really significantly identified as terminal illnesses but with heart disease it may not be like a physical pain like um like a a shot of pain but it might be the the labored breathing and the anxiety that comes with that that's very very uncomfortable for a person they don't you know they're gasping for them and and how to what degree that can medically be managed is is critically important um but it is also important that we give people that are experiencing that the medications that give them as much comfort as possible, but other techniques for calming themselves when they're when they're experiencing shortness of breath and anything else that might be uh, contributing to that level of anxiety um, or that physical discomfort. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I guess that could be something as simple as you know, let's, let's if if possible, let's do some yoga or some some breathing exercises, or let's look at some photographs of your childhood or something yeah, along some those imagery lines. work or um, you know anything like that. Absolutely. The hospice here, specifically hospice of the Chesapeake, you guys have really grown over the years since you were established in the 1970s. I know that there was a hospice house up in Linthicum. Um, Ferndale, Linthicum? One it was Linthicum, that, yeah, Tate House. That you had. And there, there is one that I pass on Route 2 down mm-hmm. in Harwood. That's the Mandarin, Mandarin House. Mm-hmm. And you've got this new campus up in Pasadena. Mm-hmm. I was last, I think, in your corporate offices when you're in the industrial park up on Defense right. Highway. Yeah. What are the different programs that hospice has here? Sure. So our hospice, Hospice of the Chesapeake, has um, evolved over those 40 years that we've you know been serving the community. Um, to not serve just Anne Arundel County, but also Prince George's County. So that's one way that we've changed and evolved in a pretty significant way in terms of really trying to 
as you said, you know, get people the care that they need that they should could benefit from when they need um, hospice care or other kinds of things. So the other kinds of things we've really developed and made a part of our overall services uh, is closely linked to the hospice experience, which is our, our grief and loss, which we house in our Chesapeake Life Center. So there we take care of, of the needs of family members or loved ones, it could sure. be neighbors, friends, whoever, who have experienced the loss of someone who's been on hospice care and needs some additional support in grieving. Many, many most people prob, you know, uh, work through the grieving process um, without additional support, professional support, but there are many who benefit from additional support. Well, I'm going to so go back into my that. college days, but it was... Um Dr. Kulba Ross had, what was it, the seven, did she have the seven? Five, five stages, five stages of, of, uh, of death and dying. People don't know how to deal with that sometimes. Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's, it's us being on that journey with them. So our journey with a patient who's on hospice isn't with the patient alone. It's certainly that's uh, the focal point. But the family, the surrounding support network of that individual is critically important to how we carry out the hospice care while the patient is alive. But it's also that we're there for people after the loss of the loved one. And as you said, you know, that that additional support or just even knowing that that's there is comforting for people. And then um, their comfort level of accessing that care, um, we try to make that um, as open and inviting as possible should they need it. And our Life Center has been a, a critical uh, component of our services, both here and in Prince George's County as a whole. And then we've realized that because of our expertise in working with family members, friends um, who have lost someone in hospice care, we, we've developed an expertise that could be of value to people who have other kinds of losses. Um, and so about 50% of the people we care for in our life center are people who are dealing with grief and loss that haven't had a hospice experience necessarily, but have had a tragic loss of some other sort. So somebody may have died of suicide and then, suicide, uh, addiction related, a car accident tragic, or something yeah, like that. An unexpected loss, like a car accident, right? What is the cost of all this to the to the patient and to the family and and whatnot? There, how does that work? With hospice itself, there's typically little or no cost. It's it's primarily covered by Medicare for many of our patients because they're on Medicare um, or other private insurances uh, that all have um, some hospice benefit. No one for us, because we're a community-based nonprofit hospice, no one who needs our care, regardless of their ability to pay or inability to pay, um, would be uh, charged for those services. That's where our philanthropic support is so important to help us carry out that mission. Um, uh, Anything related to the hospice diagnosis, be it cancer or heart disease or whatever, anything related to that, the medical equipment, the medications, um, we are paid through the insurer um, on a daily rate to cover all of those, and then we have to manage within that okay. that that, um, that uh, compensation. Okay, so then, whereas a private industry may turn around, and uh, if you say somebody that is does not have the ability to pay comes in, and that you do provide palliative care, and you, you've incurred some expenses, that person would not necessarily be billed. Uh, or the or the the estate necessarily, but that's where you do require. And I know you do an awful lot of fundraising, Correct. and I, I, that's where the larger community steps in to support the larger community. Right, exactly to help where that need um, where that reimbursement isn't there for someone because of their either lack of insurance or under insurance or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's fantastic. What does the Mandarin House do? What are the what are the different facilities that you have? We talked about Chesapeake Life Center and the grief support for the family members, and and I know you've got a wonderful program for children, which is particularly difficult for for kids when you find a uh, you know a parent that dies fairly young, uh, with you know whether it be cancer and whatnot, dealing with the children on that. But what what does the Mandarin House do? That's in a residence. So it's so the man, both the Mandarin Inpatient Center on in Harwood on Route Two and our Inpatient Center here, the Rebecca Fortney Inpatient Center here, both are intended. I guess the best uh, way to sum it up would be as alternatives to hospitalization. So rather than a patient who's on hospice care going back to um, an acute care hospital, be it Anne Arundel Medical Center or Baltimore, Washington or Prince George's Community or whatever, if they're on hospice care, going back there for a, an acute change in their condition, mm-hmm. 
or a sudden change or a dramatic change in their condition, they would come to one of our facilities to continue that hospice care approach in a 24-7 acute care hospice facility. Okay. It's typically shorter term. It's, it's not necessarily a long-term residential kind of care, although sometimes people will stay on a little bit longer than they might in a hospital. But, but mostly it's about helping that patient um, with whatever their change in condition has been. They, again, they might have experience of real severe shortness of breath that we're not able to get quite as well managed as we, as we want it to in the home setting or in their facility where they're living. So coming to one of the Mandarin Center or the Fortney Center helps us get 24-7 care, adjust the medications, really evaluate deeply you know, what's going on, get them comfortable again so they can return back to their home setting or wherever they call home. So, because that's where most people want to be. Uh, now, sometimes people come there and they and they end up transitioning um, there, and and so their their death occurs in one of our facilities. Okay. But just as often, if not more, um, our goal is to help people get back to their home setting where they want to be, which is the mo- which is the most which is the most comfortable place to be, exactly. without without a doubt. And with them be having achieved a level of comfort that we may not have been able to achieve without them coming into the inpatient center. You you mentioned going back into the home setting and whatnot. Now, hospice will go wherever it needs to go. Wherever people call home, Um, their own private residence, um, home, apartment, whatever it might be. Assisted living, more and more people are choosing to go into assisted living facilities for more support, more community, whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. Um, So we definitely provide care there. In skilled nursing, where there's more skilled need. Uh, because of a person's physical condition, we, we provide hospice care there, as well as our supportive care services, what's been known as palliative care. We do those in all of those settings as well. Just sort of a stupid thing. I just realized about a month ago that there's an extra I in palliative care. <laughs> I always thought it was P-A-L-L-A-T-I-V-E uh-huh. and all that. I'm like, where did that extra I come from? <laughs> I had to look it it's, up. And, it's a Latin. <laughs> and then figure it out. It's like, okay. <laughs> What is Chesapeake Palliative Medicine, speaking of the the crazy eye that's in there? Well, that's a a great question because a lot of people don't understand what palliative is or means. um, And basically, it does mean comfort care, right? Um, But what we found is that that term itself doesn't really resonate well. And so our approach to the specialty of palliative medicine is still the practice we do. We, We have now changed the name of our Chesapeake Palliative Medicine Services to Chesapeake supportive care. Um, and so supportive care is, is to communicate that kind of overall surrounding support of a team that will work with someone no matter what stage of illness they're at. They may not need hospice care yet, but they could benefit from that whole person care, conversations about what their goals of care are, um, addressing their medications, finding the best levels of comfort for themselves as to where they are at that time. So Chesapeake supportive care is the uh, service line that we are now providing that that brings palliative care to people. Okay, you said that does not necessarily need to be under quote hospice care for that. That's so that may be somebody that is uh, dealing with cancer that has not been terminally diagnosed at this point. Right, they might be at an early stage of that. They're still undergoing um, treatment for um, it could be chemotherapy, radiation therapy, combination thereof, for cure, looking to um, to fight the illness. It, but the incorporating that supportive care physician, nurse practitioner, social worker can bring another dimension to their care, um, identifying ways in which they need to, um, to cope with that, to uh, find comfort physically, spiritually, emotionally with that process, um, and to understand, you know, what their choices are along the way. All the way along. And, and in this type of a care, I mean, is this just a you sort of breeze in, check out, check on the people and, and head on out? Or is it more extensive? That, so our, our palliative care providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, typically that's who you'd have your first appointment with for a palliative care um, consultation visit. Um, those can go um, well over an hour. Seventy minutes is kind of the average. So it's that certainly unusual can, to see a doctor for that long. Exa- exactly, it is, and and it's because that time is needed to really explore. So, what are you experiencing? What questions do you have? What do you hope to achieve through your care? And to really understand the person's values, get a real good sense of what their understanding is of their illness. 
and what the progression of that illness might be so that that time is needed and, uh, and those practitioners are trained to have that kind of conversation um, that goes into that kind of depth. And it's a specialty that is brought into the healthcare system specifically for that purpose because other physicians practicing and, you know, for other purposes in different ways don't have or and may not need that kind of time to do what they need to do. And our palliative care providers then become a part of that broader team by engaging in that conversation and bringing what they've learned and partnering with the patient and family going forward for their care. It's really a, a time-intensive thing, which is certainly time well spent. Well, you think about it. I mean, you wouldn't rest a surgery, right, that, that needs the time that it takes to do a, an right. intricate surgery. A surgeon's not going to, I mean, they, they're going to find is the most efficient way to do it. But if it takes an hour to do it, it takes an hour, an hour to, to do, do it. it. To get a sense of what a person's needs are, their understanding of their illness, what they want, you know, for their for the future of their last weeks, months, years, maybe of life, that takes takes time, and so it so we devote that time. Seems like this would be a great thing to have, like just in general. You know, yeah. When you go to your pediatrician, when you're perfectly healthy, just to have the the social worker and the and everything else throughout there. Exactly. What don't we know about hospice? What's something that would surprise most people to know, whether it be the hospice of the Chesapeake or whether it be just hospice, hospice in general? I think what people, I don't know if it's most surprising. I think what's most I don't know, unfortunate is that people still aren't getting the hospice care to the extent that they that they could truly benefit from it. In other words, people are accessing hospice care still very, very late. People are still thinking about hospice as something that can help them, help them only in the last days or weeks of life rather than the many weeks or months of life leading up to that where they can really get the support and really have the accompaniment on their journey to experience comfort healing when cure isn't available but healing of emotional um, uh, state or spiritual elements or even again physical comfort People live with physical discomfort much longer than they need to because they associate hospice with imminent death. That's the end, the end and, of the road. And it's not imminent death. It's about final months of the journey of life. Just like we prepare for birth for up to nine, nine months, months before, that's a very comfortable thing for people. Preparing for the final day um, rather than you know birth into a new life, whatever people's beliefs are about that. Why not prepare longer for that leading up to it and take care of ourselves and each other in that way? My mother passed away very quickly. And when hospice had come in, it was literally days. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a little bit little bit longer. And I remember they came in probably six months before he passed. And uh, it was like, okay, well, we'll be back in you know a couple of weeks to check on you. And it was just sort of this, oh, hey, how you doing? Okay, great, good to see you. We'll you know we'll look under here, we'll look over there, we'll poke you here, and uh, do you need anything else? And off they went. Mm -hmm. And then certainly as it got a little bit closer toward the end of his life, it was a little bit more frequent, and I could really evaluate there. And and that was something that I learned with the second death that I had experienced of my parents. Um, and I think it's uh, there's a lot of conversations that today's people need to have as parents are staying active and living older longer and everything else i mean we you look at memory care um you know you look at you know do we need to go into you mentioned assisted living do we need to go into a continuing care type of a place and they're all difficult conversations to have just as pretty much everything at hospice has to have but i think that it's it's so critical to have them to set the expectations to know what you're going through yeah and again that's where it comes into you know, it's it's about the whole family as well. I mean, you are part of that process and, and have your own thoughts and feelings about your mother's journey and want to support her and be part of that or your father's or whoever it might be. Um, and, you know, you, you describe sort of that intermittent care that hospice provides over months. Um, each of those visits should be, and I believe is, not just with our hospice, but all hospices, I would hope, each of those interactions is gaining important information about what's happening and listening for, you know, is there a change in this condition physically or otherwise? Are they talking about some things or is there sort of a veiled question about their their meaning of life or the goal that they have, you know, the, the goals of their care come through in those important meaning about, you know, they, they want to be comfortable, but they want to stay alert. So altering the medication in such a way so that we get them to the most comfortable place without having them be 
sleepy or drowsy. And then that might change later on. That might be that they'll accept being a little more drowsy to gain a little more comfort. And each of those interactions that our nurse or our social worker or our aide or even the volunteer who's in there is gaining information about and assessing what are the true needs of the patients and what are their goals, what, do they, what it means comfort for them, and how can we help them achieve that. And that's, again, the family members, the patient, all involved. You had mentioned your medical staff, your volunteers, your social workers. So you guys cover the whole, the hospice covers the whole spectrum of, right. of, our, of needs. Yeah. Our belief that that model is built out of that belief of whole person care. That there's no one discipline, even the doctor, the nurse, that medical person alone can't do it alone. Um, they're critically important to it. But it's that's why we have a team of various disciplines, people who approach care from different vantage points. Um, so required by Medicare and other insurers is that if we're, if we're going to support this care, we expect that a doctor will be involved and a nurse will be involved, and, and that's defined the level of involvement, right. social worker, chaplain, aide. Right. Um, and even volunteer is, is a required. What does a volunteer do at hospice? Oh, many, many different things. But I mean, the, I'm, I'm the, sure they're making copies. Yeah, they, <laughs> so there's that administrator. But in terms of like the, the direct uh, patient care volunteers, they, they'd also do a wide range of things. They Everything from sitting at the bedside or in the home with the patient, who um, so a family member can go to a movie or go to the grocery store. Um, or they might have a, a shared interest with the patient of, you know, literature and reading or music. And so they share that with them in a unique way that maybe the family members don't. So there's being at the bedside companioning that person as a volunteer. Um, there are some people who have unique skills um, like uh, what we call the healing arts of, uh, of Reiki or t- um, comfort touch. Uh, things like that, healing, uh, uh, healing touch, things like okay. that, that our volunteers are specifically trained to do that bring another um, uh, type of intervention and support for our patients. And families. When, when's the right time to call and to reach out to hospice? At any point in which you, you or f- your family member um, is working with their health care provider and is beginning to have questions about the question you had, well, what is this, what is this dementia Bring, right. gonna bring so if you have that question it's a it's a point at which at a minimum to reach out and find out more about supportive care quote unquote palliative care um, because it may not be a terminal diagnosis yet which is what um, is the initiation for hospice care but it may be that point at which you need to start evaluating well, what are my goals for my care what's at what point will I know that I need hospice care um, but typically, if you ask yourself the question, would I be surprised if myself or my loved one might not be here a year from now? If, you, if you're thinking that that's a possibility, you it would be a point at which to reach out and call and say, Is, do I need hospice for myself or my loved one or do I need supportive care or do I just continue to work closely with my primary care physician, my specialist, so that I know when to make the, that call? You said you said that a terminal diagnosis is the the starting point for the uh, for hospice care. I mean, is that where it's okay? We let's just use cancer for this point. Okay, I've been diagnosed with some sort of a cancer and I've gone through chemotherapy and and radiation and I'm in remission. That's not terminal at this point. I mean, at this point, thankfully, we're to the point where we can control and and beat a lot of cancers. Um, but at some point, then if it comes back and they say that the radiation and the chemo is not working, and you know we. That's that's at the point where you guys would enter the picture. Sure, and the physician makes that determination. So it's it's in collaboration with the physician. It could be again your primary care physician. It could be one of the specialists involved in in a person's care. That's who determines the prognosis um, based on the diagnosis and where that person is in their experience of that illness. And along with it might be a primary diagnosis again of heart disease or cancer or dementia. But there might be other elements that um, are contributing to the ultimate prognosis. There might be diabetes involved. There might be um, a multiple sure. types of uh, illnesses that are contributing that are to all working the, together the to... prognosis and the expected life expectancy um, of that individual. Again, so that we can make the best determination of getting them the right care at the right time in the best possible setting. Is there a typical time frame for hospice care? I mean, uh, it seems to me like it could last for, you know, years, if you will, potentially. I mean, but 
primarily, for the most part, it tends to be a little bit shorter than that. In, it, it varies, but um, the average stay for somebody in, in hospice care is about 50 to 60 days, depending on you know okay. the condition. That could be longer. As, it, as we said, the, the, the benefit, the hospice benefit, is designed to support people for six months, sometimes more because people live and you die You don't know what your body yeah, is going to exactly, do. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes it's, it's less. What we're what our goal is always is to make sure that people get the richest benefit of what we do for the time that's most appropriate for them, and we believe that that's typically more like months than weeks or days. So that again, we can really do those those kinds of intermittent visits in the home setting or the facilities where people live and help them uncover what their needs are and determine based on their goals what kind of care is is designed for them. Well, if nothing else, I mean, I see this as a great analogy as far as giving birth, but the the preparation for the end of life and that it not just the patient for the, you know, for the family and everything else. This is what's happening. This is what what to expect um, as opposed to the phone call that you get at, you know, in the middle of dinner saying that, you know, your love your loved one has passed on. And then the next stop is a, at a funeral home and everything else like this. This is able to turn around and bring, you know, peace and let the person who is affected bring in their family, the people that they care about. Uh, to say goodbye. I mean, I hear all these wonderful stories about these people that have a little bit of extra money. They say, you know, I, I've got six weeks and I want to throw a hell of a party. <laughs> so let's let's do it here right now. Let's mm-hmm. call the caterer and, and uh, I'm not going to be able to eat or drink, but I'm going to be here and we're going to have fun. And that's uh, And I think that's a very important thing. And I think that really goes a long way to helping the survivors, the people that are going to be remain behind trying to put the pieces of all this together to cope with it when it does happen. And then certainly the resources that you have after it happens to be able to um, move on. Because, I mean, as, as cold as it may sound, life does go on. And we all have to, you know, we all have to move on. We have to figure out what's what our next step is without that person in our life. Yeah, what leads up to those final moments and, and ultimately the transition from life to death is um, it, it, it's it's a wide range of experiences. For some, it, it goes relatively smoothly and predictable, but it's always that unknown because we don't know. And it's not always easy. And that's why that additional support from a team who has walked with literally hundreds, thousands of people on this path can bring a lot of knowledge and expertise. We can't, we can't predict everything, but we can try to help people know what to expect given the course of their, their illness. Which is something that a, that a medical doctor typically cannot. Um, I mean, typically they're, they're based on let's, let's treat the illness, let's treat the pain, let's treat this and, and try to get them better. I find most doctors are, and which is certainly a, a laudable goal, but it- they're much more in the mentality of curing and the, and uh, we're our physicians. The, the the specialty of palliative care, which which is the the hospice approach to to medical care, um, is to to anticipate. Well, what's going to happen next with this illness? Now, your specialists and your primary care can give you certainly good information about that and such. But to and that's why we work very closely with community physicians. We don't just segment off. Right. We. St- really work hard to stay in touch with the primary care, especially if they want to be continue to be engaged or their specialists, be it again, a cardiologist or a oncologist or whoever that specialist might be. Well, it is a team effort. I mean, it is, as, as you said, from, you know, from the primaries to the hospice, to the volunteers, to the social workers and everything else. I know in the spring, you always do have a big gala. So if you can attend one of the galas, uh, certainly do that. That is a wonderful uh, way to support. You do raise an incredible amount of money. I know uh, my friend Steve Samaras, I believe, was your MC, your MC last year. And he, I remember he said, I hate my wife. She yeah. volunteered me for this. <laughs> and I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, he did, he did he, remarkably he, he, well. He did. He great. did. He did great. really well. There's there's plenty of ways to offer support, and it's something that this is when I consider the support that you would give to the hospice. This is really giving back to the community uh, itself. Well, there's it's not, you know we're as we talked about earlier, uh, you know we're we're become such a important part of the fabric of the community here um, through events that we do through where we serve people, because we serve people at every stage of life. You mentioned pediatrics earlier. We take care of children who are both themselves experience terminal illness or they have lost or are losing 
a, a loved one, a parent, or a, um, or a grandparent, sibling or, or something. A sibling. Um, so uh, some of our events are geared toward that, both educationally or um, in terms of philanthropic support or, um, or just acknowledging people's experience and journey with, uh, with children's illness and loss. Um, our veterans program. And so the ways in which people experience life is also, it, it's just part of what they will experience in their last stages of life. Mm-hmm. And it's and that's where we discover what's really important to people and their military experience, their family, their, um, their questions about what they've contributed, all that comes through. And that's reflected in what we do in the community and the way in which we try to communicate with people in the community um, through whether it be fundraising events or educational events or us supporting other our partnerships with hospitals in the area, with other nonprofit agencies that provide um, different kinds of care than we do, but complementary to what we do. Wellness House, Partners in Care, um, the Coordinating Center. We, we really work and really try to coordinate the care we do with them and, right. and look at ourselves as partners with them. How many other hospices are there in Maryland? I mean, I know you mentioned that we handle Anne Arundel County and Prince George's County. Throughout Maryland, there are, I believe, now 26, I believe, okay. 23 or 26. And then within uh, different geographic areas, there are usually um, several in each area that provide. How many people do you serve in a year now? I know I remember reading briefly your timeline, and it was like in 1974, and we had four people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We serve four people in that one year. Um, now we're serving over three thousand people each year, and on a daily basis, approximately around four hundred and seventy every day, um, close to five hundred every day. Great work. That's just in hospice too. That's you right. know that's the hospice piece. I mean, supportive care, the the life center, all of that is extension as well, and and we're touching people's lives um, beyond that as well. What is the best way to learn more about Hospice of the Chesapeake? Your website? Our website is, is a great uh, tool and resource for people in the community. Um, so I'd encourage people to go to our www.hospicechesapeake.org. We also do a lot of different community education events. Uh, we do Facebook Live topics uh, on a regular basis that have become a great resource to the community. So any ways in which, or call us, just call us and we'll let you know different uh, ways in which we can point you to information that you need or events that we're doing that will enhance the understanding. Ben Marc Antonio, thank you very much for your time today and uh, continued good luck with the uh, Hospice of the Chesapeake people. Check them out, hospicechesapeake.org. The party is pretty good in the spring. I will, yeah, I will admit, get on the list and get to that party. It's usually up at one of the uh, airport, or has been in the airport hotels We've, for a while. Yeah, nearby. This year we're doing it actually in uh, at the hotel on the University of Maryland campus in College Park. Ben Marc Antonio, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this special podcast for I Am Annapolis. Please be sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinions. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the I Am Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you your local news direct to your phone or tablet every Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. Subscribe on iTunes or Google Play.